Hi, hello everybody. Thank you very much for staying. Um, this talk is about software development and family life. There's going to be a lot of information. I looked everything up to the best of my ability. Call me out if something seems incorrect. Um, so this is my name. I am Juan Carlos Ospina Gonzalez. And um, I'm a perfectly adequate IES developer. Um, so uh, before I begin, I want to show a number. I want to know if it checks out a little bit. Um, yeah. So how many, how, many, um, how many parents do we have? Whoa. One, two, three. OK. That's, that's more than I expected. Pretty cool. OK, so, uh, so apparently, um, according to a Stack Overflow developer survey of this year, about 60% to 40% split. OK? So now let's talk a little bit about software development and family life. Uh, the reason, this is a topic that is really, really dear to my heart, and the reason I want to talk about it is because I believe that uh, even in 2019, there are still sort of unconscious biases and assumptions uh, that, that, that we don't really think about in our industry. And, um, and I think it's important because uh, we all have a family life. We all do, even if, even if we don't have an actual family. I mean, I mean, we all have a family. We have parents, we have uncles. Even if you don't have children, you, you still have family life. So this is, this is very important. Um, the reason I want to talk about this is because I, I do think that the software development industry is unfriendly to family life in some ways. I will explain in which ways. Uh, the reason I think this happens is because, I thought about this a while, I think software development is still kind of tailored to this mythical and encumbered worker. Mythical and encumbered worker. So what is that? What does that mean? So unencumbered, Dutch word, word. don't know if I said it right. Uh, that's, that's the definition. I'm going to read you a quote from a book. It says, he doesn't need to concern himself with taking care of children and elderly relatives, cooking, cleaning, doctor's appointments, grocery shopping. A workplace dedicated on the assumption that a worker can come in to work every day at times and locations that are unrelated to location or opening hours of school, childcare, doctor, and grocery stores. Um, to illustrate this point, this is, this, is a, this is a quote that I found. It's a little bit outdated, but bear with me. It says, young people just have simpler lives. We may not own a car. We may not have a family. Simplicity in life allows you to focus on what's important. Who said it? Uh, Max Zuckerberg, of course. 2007, I mean, uh, you know, he changed his mind. Changed his mind. Uh, he didn't change his mind. He changed his mind for himself. He changed his mind for himself, yeah. You know, and it's, 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 it's not the point to tear down Mark Zuckerberg. I'm, you know, after, after all, I'm, you know, I'm nobody. And he's, uh, you know, he's just a guy who who is worth uh, 72.9 billion US dollars, which he made selling our privacy and data to the highest bidder. I mean, uh, who am I? Uh, but the point is that uh, the, the, there's, there's a lot of uh, influence, influence the, the role models that influence our perceptions. Um, and and, and, and they, they sort of, over the years, created a myth, you know, this, this, this rock star, rock star programmer, you know, have you ever asked people tell you you're the rock star programmer or ask you if you're the rock star programmer? Uh, you know, this, uh, you have to be passionate, passionate. We heard about this already many times. It's, it's this keyword is everywhere. Um, so um, there's, there's another quote, quote from a keynote I saw. It says that they're, they're basically the... The myth says that you not only have to have talent, you also need to be passionate to be able to be a good programmer. Uh, but yeah, this is, this is the myth. You know, we have to be ninjas, you know, like this guy. It doesn't matter if we have mental problems, as long as we are really good ninjas and programmers. Uh, sorry, Rockstar programmers. Uh, you know, the next, the next slide. I'm really sorry, I'm gonna... So, um, so for us, you know, obviously this guy means a lot. Is the reason we have a job. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to tread carefully. I'm going to tread carefully here. Give me a second. Um, you know, the, 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 I just think the reason I'm going to bring this up is because, uh, you know, this guy is really important, obviously. 
But we don't all need to be this guy. You know, we don't, we don't all need to be Steve Jobs. And we really shouldn't, which is more important, be like Steve Jobs or who you, whoever your favorite mythical programmer is. And, you know, since we're talking about family life, I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, I looked, I looked up a little bit of family life from this guy. Uh, I, I, found, I found this out. I found it very troubling. So, um, yeah, so for years, he denied parenthood of his own daughter, even if, uh, after a DNA paternity test. I didn't know that part. That part was really surprising to me. Steve Jobs' girlfriend, Chris Ann Brennan, went on welfare and had to resort to cleaning houses to support herself and her daughter. She would sometimes ask Jobs for money, but he always refused. Think about that, because this guy was a millionaire already, and his girlfriend and his daughter, his, his girlfriend was cleaning houses to support his daughter. Uh, again, I'm nobody, I'm nobody to point fingers. Um, so, um, Steve Jobs was interviewed by Times Magazine, and when questioned about the DNA, the DNA test that confirmed him as the father, uh, he said, literally 28% of the male population of the United States could be the father. Um, Jobs came to believe that he was going to be Times Man of the Year. This is back in 1983, probably a long time ago. Uh, but rather than name Jobs Person of the Year, the magazine named the computer the Machine of the Year in the issue. And uh, Jobs believed that he had been betrayed by Moritz. Moritz is the, uh, um, the journalist. He was jealous and wrote this terrible hatchet job, what's his opinion. And, um, you know, he never, you know, thought to think about, like, why, why people think this, that I'm not the man of the year. I mean, he didn't think about that. He just got defensive about it. And, you know, to be honest, now I'm going to try to save face a little bit. Uh, Chris, Brennan, Chris Ann Brennan, so the girlfriend, notes that after Job was forced out of Apple, he apologized many times over for his behavior towards her and Lisa. She also stated that Job said that he never took responsibility when she should have and that he was sorry. So, yeah, okay. We all make mistakes, but you know, it's, 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 um, it's not, it's not to, to, to just criticize, point fingers, or anything like that, but it's, it's that we have role models who are very harsh. That's kind of the point a little bit that I'm trying to make. Um, so I'm going to go back to the, this myth of the, of the genius programmer. There's this, uh, yeah, there's this presentation. There's a really good presentation. I, I really, uh, if you haven't seen this presentation, I would, I would suggest that you look that up. And uh, this is a quote from that presentation. It says, the myth of the genius programmer is extremely dangerous. On one hand, it says the entry threshold excessively high, scaring a lot of would-be programmers away. On the other hand, it also haunts those that are already programmers. Because it means that if you don't rock at programming, then basically you suck. Uh, personally, I feel this all the time. This, they call it imposter syndrome. As a result, as a programmer, all your time needs to be used on learning more programming and work, which in the end has a large impact in family life, right? I don't know. This is, this is where I'm going. Okay. The point is that we're all doing it. We're all, we're all kind of jerks, I think. I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do a, a little mea culpa here. There was a guy at my company once, and I had problems with his, with his performance. I was stressed with deadlines. Instead of being compassionate and until like a mentor, I should have. I acted like a rock star ninja, and I pointed this finger, and I said, your code is poop emoji. <laughs> now, that guy, that guy, he doesn't code iOS anymore. And, uh, you know, I hope that's not my fault, but it could be, and I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. But it really, you know, I, I thought about it later. It's, uh, it's a thing, you know, so... So, so there's this, this rough, these very rough role models that we have in the, in the industry, right? The people, we, the people we owe so much to, but we want, we want to emulate. Uh, and they have cemented the idea sort of that the industry, this industry in general, has no responsibility with society other than to make products. And that you push people hard, and that you work hard, maybe too hard. And this is part of the image that we have associated now as software developers. So, in my opinion, there's three results that come of this. 
my opinion. Right. So, I think that we have a little bit of gender discrimination going on. Then we have low quality products going on. And I think we have an artificial shortage of talent. I'll go into detail. Gender discrimination, this is not about being politically correct. That's, that's not where I want to go. That sucks. People get divided. They fight. I don't like it. Uh, but it's more about how the choices that we're making are affecting the life of real people. Especially now that technology is more important. It's in everybody's life now. Phones, everybody has them. Things we do matter sometimes. So, um, but uh, let's look at a, at a, depressing, a depressing number I've been, I've been noticing you know, throughout my life. And uh, I, I come to uh, confirm it. So software developers, kind of like this. According to the developer survey, 91% male, close to 80% female. So, um, you know, did you guys know? Do you guys know? I'm going to hit you with a fact. Do you guys know that the sex ratio in humans is approximately one to one? So what's going on? Is, is it that women are not smart enough or something? I'm sorry to be the, the, like the man giving you the woman talk, but it's just somebody has to. Um, you know, I don't think so. Do you know that ENIAC was programmed by six women? You guys know about ENIAC, right? You probably learned at school and stuff, right? Electronic, numerical, integrated computer. The first electronic general purpose computer, and it was programmed by six women. This, these are two of those women. And this was, you know, back then when programming was not about passion. Uh, actually, it used to be programming was a boring thing nobody wanted to do. I think maybe that's why, you know, so a lot of calculations by hand, stuff like that. Um, so uh, now I'm going to point the finger a little bit more inwards. Sorry to do that. Mobile developers, like us, 15 times more likely to be male. Uh, I'm going to point the finger a little bit closer to home. I, I love this community, but I was looking. I was looking. The number of attendees, right? Last time I looked, uh, 68. And uh, seven, I counted seven women. Show up. Did you show up? Yes, I see. Cool, all right, well, that puts us, seven out of 68 put us around 10%, right? I think I got my math right, no? Okay, so uh, more, more numbers about gender discrimination. So I started to look at the life of the few women who did venture to work into this world of Rockstar Ninja programmers, and um, I came across some studies so Women in Tech, the facts report from 2016 from the National Center for Women and Information Technology. The question is, partner works full-time? Women, 80%. Men, 37.9%, right? So who's working half-time and who's working full-time, right? Uh, partner has primary responsibility for household and children. So women 13%, men 50.8%. So this is for partnered, sorry. Uh, household characteristics for partnered, mid-level technical workers. So yeah, so this is a, little, this is a bit weird, right? Who's, who's taking care of home and who's, take, who's going to work? This is the quitting rate of women, sorry, of the quitting rate after 10 years in the tech industry by gender. More than 40% of women leave tech after 10 years compared to 17% of men. Reasons, uh, workplace condition, undermining behavior for managers, and a sense of feeling, of feeling stalled. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about low-quality products. Uh, I'm not talking about technically low-quality products. That's not really a problem, I think. You got a lot of really good programmers, so that's, that's, not, that's not what I'm going to talk about. I'm talking about um, products that are designed primarily bad by and for men, white men. We got voice assistants pretending to be women who are designed and built by men. So, uh, okay, I'm gonna, a few examples, okay. At the beginning, when Siri came out, you would ask her this, hey Siri, was raped? Hey, I don't know what that means. If you like, you can search a way for I was raped. Uh, and uh, you know, the Siri was created in 2011. 
And this issue was only fixed all the way to 2016. That's a long time to have this problem. And it's, it's, um, it's really hard for us guys to kind of think about this. But women, they have a lot of fear of being raped for good reason. United Nations, 215,000 cases reported annually in 65 countries. We an an estimated 91% of, of actually rape going unreported. So if there's 2,000 and 50,000 cases, that's only the ones we know about, and there's quite a lot more that we don't know about. So this is a problem, this is an actual problem. In the Netherlands, 9,000 sexual offenses, 1,200 reported rapes in 2018. That works out at about 3.2 rapes per day. Bad, not good, huh? So we have a responsibility here. Another one, my husband is beating me. I'm not sure I understand. Uh, I am depressed. I mean, it could be, it could be, but this is, this is about suicide. So, uh, Netherlands, 1,829 suicides, that's about five per day, one every five hours. But you know what Siri and all the others are really good at? Yep, knock, knock jokes. Oh, <laughs> sorry, knock, knock jokes. Man, I kind of... <laughs> Kill my own punchline, sorry. <laughs> All right, moving on. HealthKit. You guys know HealthKit, right? You love HealthKit. Everyone loves HealthKit. Uh, HealthKit was lacked when it, when, when it launched. HealthKit was lacking one very important feature. You guys know what it was? Oh, that's right. Menstrual cycles. Got it. Um, Apple released a health app that completely ignored menstruation, a bodily function experienced by more than half of the world's human population at some point in their lives. Uh, another example, uh, this woman, uh, she's a sociologist, she's Turkish, her name is there, I just, you know, I'm really bad at this, uh, I, I'm so afraid. Zeynep Tufekhi, I'm really sorry about that. Uh, so, um, Gezi Park protest in Istanbul, Turkey, 2013. Quote, I curse that what was taken for granted by male designers and male users of modern phone, phones was simply not available to me. I curse that I could not effectively document how large numbers of ordinary people had come to visit a park and they were being massively tear gassed because I simply could not take a one-handed picture. Especially cursed that I could not lift the camera above my head, hold it steady, and take a picture, something I had seen countless men with larger hands do all the time. Large phones are designed for la large men hands. You think it has little consequence? Oh, just use both hands. But it knows there's consequences. There's, there's all kinds of things that we don't think about. And if it's just us guys in the room thinking about these things, then we're not going to get to this. Uh, this is, well, not related to mobile development exactly. This is a technology product. Have you ever heard about the Cartman Artificial Heart? The Cartman Artificial Heart features sensor to monitor and adjust blood flow depending on the body's demands. The artificial heart is designed to mimic the dual chamber pumping action of a real human heart. Really nice stuff. Uh, it fits 86% uh, of men. It is only suitable for about 20% of women. Um, so, uh, you know, heart attacks, uh, you know, uh, statistically speaking, more men have heart attacks. I know that, but I started looking it up. Heart attacks are more severe in women than in men, actually. During the first year, women are 50% more likely to die than men. In the first six years after a heart attack, women are also twice as likely to have a second heart attack. Heart disease is the leading cause of death for men and women. So. So what if, um, you know, they, they, ask, they ask the company, well, what about doing some for women? And they would say, they're not working on a smarter model because that would entail significant investment and resources over multiple years. So uh, it's, it's a little bit unfair, right? So like, what if it was, you know, your mom, your sister, something like that, you know? And you get this for an answer. Um, okay. Now let's talk about this artificial shortage of talent. Uh, so um, I was looking 
I've had like some really hard numbers on, 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 on whether there is this lack of people or not. So uh, I found this, um, found these quotes. Uh, by the way, all everything, their sources, I'll, I'll give it to you later. A lack, a lack of available talent is the number one obstacle keeping CIOs, so I think chief information officers, globally from achieving their objectives. With an estimated one million computer programming jobs in the US expected to go unfulfilled by 2020, next year. Many companies are turning to non-traditional candidates and internal, tr internal training to fill the tech job gaps. Internal training, oh no. In some cases, talent is available, but it comes at a cost, said Dustin Bolander, CIO of Technology Point Austin, where Technology Point is based, is, quote unquote, extremely competitive right now, Bolander said. We're having to offer top benefits, like full paid health insurance to compete. God, no. <laughs> Would anybody think of the corporations? Okay. So there's a shortage of rock stars, apparently. I think it's artificial. I think we've done it to ourselves. I, to uh, you know, prove a point, I kind of went online, started looking at some ads for jobs. Okay, so I started looking at ads. These are ads that are, around, are out right now. Okay, so I started to look at the ads, and I started to see kind of a pattern, like who is this ad tailored for? Who is this ad tailored for? You know? So uh, I'm gonna make emphasis here. Bi-weekly hackathons, weekly drinks, fun company events. Who is this ad tailored for? This is another one. I'm gonna, again, focus on a social atmosphere, lunch, Friday drinks, parties, sports, etc. An informal, fun, and driven culture. Right, 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 okay. Uh, oh, this one, this is, this is my favorite. I learned a new word, I learned a new Dutch word. Oh wait, no, that's this one, it's the next one. But this one's also fun. Hey, hey, Friday drinks, and then we mention, we brew our own beer in the office. Hell yeah, okay. And this is the one where I learned learn a new word. You guys know this word? <laughs> I didn't know this word. It's a great word, huh? Fry Jimbo, right? That. So that's what we have. This is the perks that we're offered. This is the ads that we're reading. Where are they tailored for? Another quote, long hours, hackathons on the weekends, and staying up all night crushing it. Even some of the perks, like free dinner in the office, or beer after work, double as team building tools and a way to keep employees in the office later. So yeah, I, just, I get the idea that we all, like if I just read these ads and stuff, uh, we only seem to want to work with people who are just like us, right? And this is a quote too, if you're looking for this type of obsessive behavior, then you're looking for a typically young male behavior. This is from Invisible Women. <sighs> okay, how do we change? How do we change? How do we attract people who are not like us? How do we make technology more friendly to family life? There are some ideas that I'm gonna throw and they're adapted from an article called Silicon Valley Perks for some workers a struggle for parents. There's nothing new, so from 2015. Okay, emphasize responsibilities of male parents. Recalibrate assumptions around parenthood and work productivity. So uh, even in a really progressive country like ours, I realize we're very lucky, we are. But okay, this is the parental leave policy in the Netherlands. When a child is born, women get 16 weeks off, men get one week off. It's changing this year, they made it bigger. Uh, but this is for now what we have. But what is the government telling me here in a really sort of way? What is, what is the message? The message is women take care of the kid, men goes to work, right? Uh, you know, I love our country, don't get me wrong. But uh, there are, you know, other countries that have policies that I find much better, much more positive. So, 480 days in Sweden, shared, shared. That means each parent gets at least 90 days, right? At close to 80%, by 2016, Sweden has the highest female employment figures in the European Union. Why? Well, you can see. Uh, it also has one of the highest levels of paternity leave uptake in the world, with nine out of ten fathers fathers taking an average of three to four months leave. So it's not only the woman who has to go and start working part-time, has to choose between her career, 
and having kids because the responsibility is shared, right? So there's other type of parental leave in the Netherlands. Uh, it's called uh, Alders Haberloaf. Uh, so uh, this means that uh, the father can get, the partner or father can get maximum 26 times hours work per week until the offspring turns eight, right? So you can't take, say, four hours a week or two hours a week or something. It's your papa dach. You can go there, uh, stay at home, help out. Unfortunately, it's only taken by 11% of fathers. 11%. The reasons, the boss says, it's too complicated. The boss says, it doesn't fit our fun company culture of bring beer at the office. And there is a lack of male, rail mo of male role models that actually do take the parental leave. There's not that many. We actually, instead, praise the people who sacrifice their family to be working a lot, right? So that's, you know, the other way around. We need to provide more inclusive job perks. What does this mean? Uh, okay, late night at the office, right? Can happen. They ordered the pizza because we have to eat. That's a work expense. Childcare, emergency childcare, calling the babysitter. Is that a work expense? Right, 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 right. I think we should offer supplementary and maternity, uh, maternity and paternity leave. I mean, there is the law here is, it gives us rights to some stuff, but why cannot we offer more on top of that? Um, so, um, when Google noticed that they were losing women who had just given birth at twice the rate of other employees, they increased their maternity leave from three months at partial pay to five months at full pay, and the quit rate dropped 50%. But you know what we do have instead? <sighs> Nerf wars. It can be done. It can be done, people. It's not impossible. This is another ad that I did find, which I like very much. Um, okay, but you might say, hey, we're not Google. We cannot put like all these things, all these resources. Well, you know, what I say to that is this poop emoji. <laughs> I think it's possible. I think it is possible. You know how I know it's possible? I was involved in this project. I'm going to tell you very quickly about it. But it, it, it taught me that it can be done. So Mothers in Us Residency is a studio space combined with a communal daycare. The residency is specialized in supporting emerging women artists who are also mothers. Mothers in Arts is free of charge. The artists agree on taking turns to work and look after each other's children and around an organized work schedule. So I, I, I was a helping hand in this project. It was, it was amazing. With a budget of under 5,000 euros. This was a total budget for everything. They provided free daycare for four children for four days a week for three months. For the same body, budget, under 5,000 euros, they organize events and lectures. Like this. For the same budget of under 5,000 euros, they produce a mini documentary, which you can look up on YouTube. There's a link. For the budget of under 5,000K, they house an international artist from Brazil and her daughter for three months. You, you, you know how rent is in Amsterdam. OK. Now, we also need to allow for flexible schedules. I know we're almost there. A lot of us have flexible schedules. I really like that. Uh, but uh, employees shouldn't need to work strictly nine to five days. They should be allowed to put in their work hours in ways that accommodate both their families and their professional lives. Even if you don't have children, you still have family life. And it also means not making people feel like they're being given a favor for arranging their schedule. You know, this, this should be common practice, should be a non-issue, should be for everybody, not just people with kids. If you do it only for people with kids, then, you know, even if you do get it, you do feel that pressure, like, hey, I'm getting all this time off, and all these people who don't have kids don't get the time off, and it's, it, it's like, it, it feels uneven. You feel pressure, so it has to be for everybody. How about this? I, I have yet to find, like, a job that says 36 hours, 32 hours. It's always 40 hours or more, of course. So to sum it up, we need to focus on results, you know, coding, developing sales presentation, responding to customer emails, developing new products and features. That's what we should be focusing on. And I would say, be compassionate, not passionate. Forget about that word. I hate that word. Try to remember that software development is just a job. You don't need to be passionate. And not everybody needs to be Steve Jobs or Mark Zuckerberg, whatever. 
given these numbers that we've been showing our, about our industry, it would probably be better if instead of you know, just being chasing all this perfection, maybe we'd just be like, just, just kind of adequate our jobs. We just did our job. And if you're hiring, please stop looking for passionate, unencumbered, rock star, hacker, ninjas. Thank you very much. Uh, this is where you can find all these sources. There's, I, I try to do my best. It's a long list. There's a lot of stuff in there. It's really cool. You, you, should, you should look it up. Uh, okay, well, uh, that's, uh, that's 30 minutes. That's, uh, that's it. So, um, questions? Yes, gentlemen. Thank you for that great talk. Uh-huh. Uh, I have two uh, remarks or questions. So, uh, I think, personally, that the situation in Netherlands is different from the United States. Uh, I've been a developer now for about uh, eight years, and I've never had a problem if I say, oh, I'm only four days a week because I have a problem. All the time you accept that without any question whatsoever. Yep. Okay. Yep. Great. Yep. And the other thing is, so, so a lot of new companies nowadays, have this idea of a limited holidays, where, they, where basically they put you with the responsibility of your own vacation, uh, where they sort of say, ah, yes, if you want three months holiday, yes, take it. Of course, it doesn't work that way, but at least they claim that you can do that. American companies, uh, I don't know the name, but just maybe some people can help me out here. It's a, it's a new kind of thing, because they want to attract uh, more developers or, so, or more people. And in America, of course, you only have five days holiday. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, uh, but of course, when you say, okay, I'm going on three, week, three months holiday in Brazil, they probably fire you anyway. But uh, they claim that you, have, that you can then have more flexibility in, yeah, do, do, uh, do private things during the week. Okay, well, one, one thing that I should have mentioned is that uh, I don't work as a freelancer. I think, I think maybe freelancer, you're talking about a freelancer. Yeah, yeah. I, I work more, uh, you know, in Londines, like, so I have a jobby job, job kind of thing. Um, the numbers I did mention about the taking the, 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 the I'll describe it low, um, that, that, that comes from an actual article that comes from, you know, Bureau of Statistics. So, uh, you know, I have an experience, somebody tell me that that's not good to do. Uh, I, I did actually uh, talk with my boss about it because I do want to take it. He was okay with it. He seemed a bit surprised, but he seemed to take it okay. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you're right. The situation is very different from the United States. I haven't worked there personally, but I do know that they're very different. Yeah, um, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, no, the Sweden thing, that's, uh, yeah, it's pretty cool, right? Uh, I really think it's like, it changes so much if, if you change the mindset that, 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 that you also have to be in the house, you know, that it's not just your, your woman doing that. Or your partner doing that, you know, uh, it changes so many things. You know, um, if if you think about that, women have to work half time or, or not work at all. We're talking about we're talking about something that is not about being politically correct. We're talking about uh, a loss for the uh, what is it called? The number of the economy of the country, the how much money is being made, because that means that half the population is basically unemployed. You know, and if they could be employed, that means that there will be more money in the economy. There would be more more everything. You know, so. Doing this kind of thing, you know, they say it's too expensive, blah, 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 where is the money going to come from? But actually, it's more expensive not to do it, because, because if you did do it, you would see an increase in of jobs being taken, work being done, because more people would be working, right? Yeah. Just a, just a comment. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with focus, especially with developers. Uh, we have the mindset that we have to dig in and be there all night and, and, and uh, have a hackathon and stay, because coming back into it, once you pull out of the code, it takes, the, the ramp up time to get back in is, is, is large, right? So. Uh, you mean after you've taken some time off, exactly. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so that, that's critical to, to, like for myself, I'm a freelancer as well. Mm -hmm. Anytime I leave code, I come back and I try to find where I was and then usually it's like an hour later. And it's just, it, it's, it's difficult to do that. Um, that's part, Partly why it's tied to all these uh, like stay stay at work longer and try to try to work harder. This just the this the company. Yeah, this 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 what you're mentioning about. This is uh, this was also in one of the documents that I found, and it will be in, that is in the sources. 
uh, one of the reasons this, this profession is really hostile is because there is, there is this pressure much more than in any other industry, right? You have to be stay up to date in all these things. There are companies that have uh, addressed it somehow. Like for, I, know, I know that Google does offer programs where they you know, do some kind of training for people who have left the company because they had children and then they came back, right? I don't think that's something that is like out of the question for any other company to do, right? Like, what, does it, what really does it take to have one other developer be like, yeah, let's, let's, let's have a little workshop, let's just go over some stuff that maybe, maybe happened while you were away. I don't, I don't think that's bad. But yeah, that's, it's really, yeah, it's, it's a really stressing uh, profession, right? That's why the, 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 the quit rate for women especially is really high. Who is the bad guy? Like, in, Who is the bad guy? In, in a company, you know, you think, okay, we look at the company, it's kind of a no face, but there are also management, there are also like certain culture sort of, or, you know, you, you're, you become a manager, you become part of the cult of like, yeah, that's slave drive, and that's get the people working. Uh, what, are you, what are your thoughts around that? How to. Uh, I, I had a slide on it. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Uh, I know, I know, I know. I have the answer. <laughs> I have the answer to this one. I know, I know. Ah, uh, I, I missed it. I missed it. I missed it. Hold on. Anyway, this one. Got it. <laughs> it's us. I think it's us. I don't think there's like a bad guy. I think it's us. And, um, you know, I, I hope that you walk away from this presentation thinking that there are like these assumptions that you make. You know, you don't, you don't mean to be like this. You don't, you don't, you know, when, when you, you, you think about, yeah, the, the, the man goes to work and the, the woman stays at home taking care of the children, you just go, well, well that's just natural, right? Well, it isn't, right? But, but you have to, like, catch yourself, think about it a little bit, you know? You know, so it's, it's more about, it's not about pointing at a bad guy. It's more like about just, just the, the, there are assumptions and, 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 and you should, you know, try to think about these things, right? And, yeah, there's a lot of, you know, cultural baggage probably attached to that. I mean... It's, it's, it's a cultural big thing. I mean, I don't, I don't have a really good answer, but I would start by, you know, we are the problem, and we should change it. We should think about these things. I moved to Sweden. <laughs> oh, man. You know, it's the, the weather's bad enough here. I don't know. We actually love Sweden. Oh, yeah. Oh, you did? Yeah. The weather. I don't know. Yeah, I never lived in Sweden. Uh, sounds, uh, you know, I watched that movie, Let the Right One In. It's terrifying uh, how dark it is all the time. I don't know. You mentioned those um, applications from those different companies. Why do you think companies focus on those, those things you highlight? You, you mean, mean like, uh, like Siri? Like the fun and atmosphere, drink, something Oh, like the fun atmosphere, atmosphere and all that stuff. stuff. So what, yeah. why do you think they do that? Yeah, well, uh, the, the, the point is, uh, I think that everybody has in their collective consciousness a little bit this idea that, that they, are, they need to find these guys who are like really good, really like obsessed with programming, and they just think about programming, and they dream in programming, and they just, you know, the, the, this is, this is the, probably the collective idea that we have in there somehow. So we're looking for these people, right? We're looking for these really good technical workers because we, we think we only need to work with programmers or rockstar ninjas, right? So I think, that's, I think that's why. I think it's because we have this idea that we only have to work with these kind of people and not like, yeah, we should just work with some, you know, in, in other jobs. Nobody's going like, we're really, really passionate train driver, you know? Just, we need a guy who can drive a train, who can do it good, he, he has uh, the relevant education, he has a good safety record. I don't know, it's, I think, yeah. What do you think from the perspective of a, of a company that it's that it's good to have someone that's social in the team, that builds like a, a good foundation for the team, someone that's positive about the company in at meetups like this, um, and not, not for example, someone that leaves at 5 p.m., regardless of if that's good or bad. Um, I think there's some value in having people that want those social stuff, social things as well. I don't think we think I think I, did well. you, I think you're pitting a little bit two things against each other. You're saying that the people who live at 5 a.m. don't have the social skills to, or so, no, to no, what, what was it? That's not what I mean, but I mean it's more that there's a benefit to, to promoting your company that has having that stuff, because it creates team bonding, it creates an environment that people are maybe more positive about, that they will stay longer because they like the environment more, because they make friends at work. I'm not saying that people who don't do all that social stuff don't make friends at work, but if you want to create a culture that's 
that's based around that team feeling, then I think these things help in that. Right, right. Well, uh, I mean, I'm not, no, it's no, not no, like no. a debate. Just be yeah, 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 yeah. honest. <laughs> Pretty one kind of person, though, right? Yeah, yeah. If I think, think about this, why is it always the day drinking the paper for those things? Because, I, I, I because people were 20 or looking for that, maybe? I don't know. We go to the theater once a month. So you can also have and people do things with, with, with parents in, in, in the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Like having a barbecue or so. Yeah, but if you ask, I can imagine a lot of companies <laughs> are maybe looking for young people, and something that young people like more often is. But the point is, he's saying uh, companies are always looking for young people. Yeah, but you don't have experience of family life and then tailor the products. I, I get that, but there can be reasons for companies to want like young people. There can be people that maybe they don't want Objective C developers right now because like Swift is a new thing. You know, it's like, uh, I, the whole point of this talk is they're looking for young people because I, I they get that, don't have any. There can be a reason to be looking for young people. Yeah, they're running company. I just did. I just Uh, I don't know. So much to unpack. Uh, yeah. If they, had, if they had like morning sessions for, for parents, you wouldn't come to that? Yeah. That's fine. Exactly. I think the general group yeah. thing is always wrong. It's always yeah. bad. Group thing, so crowding in the same ideas, the same behavior, the same culture, is always bad because you stop thinking yourself and you just think with the collective mind of the group in which you are in. And that is actually also historically brought very bad consequences like the federal shapes and this kind of thing. No, I, I, I would make it more simple, like, you know, all the developers, when we're working together on an application, it's very easy to get just blind spots. And then the QA guys come and they go like, how oh, did you think of this? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like that, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah? I was thinking about the uh, uh, woman and man employed percentage in the sector. And uh, is there a chance that just women, women are not so interested in tech because of their thinking way, rather than uh, the gaps. Because the gaps exist in every uh, every field. I, you know what? This this would be a question for a woman to answer, but I I really don't think that's the case. We have, we have two. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll answer that. <laughs> now you don't it. Now you don't it. Uh, there, there's a lot. There's a lot of reasons. Uh, sort of culturally why women are are often shunted into areas that are considered uh, uh, you know less among the sciences, less among mathematics. And it's not you know I it's not necessarily because they are interested in it. It's because there's certain expectations of what are people interested in. And that differs from culture to culture. I think if you look at um, sort of percentages of people in uh, some cultures that are uh, uh, developers that are male versus female, there are some cultures where those numbers are maybe not even a hell of a lot better than they are in most of Western culture. And that's partly because um, there's not the expectation that math and science are this like thing that dudes do. And I think there's tons and tons of very interrelated stuff that can push women, sort of, even women who are interested in math and science, that pushes them away from that 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 uh, interest. And and that's like sort of not even talking about the aspects of programming that are actually much more like art than like science. And so that that's something where I think one of the things that that is really helpful for some of that stuff is to look at what are the pieces of programming that we can look at and say, okay, what are these pieces that people who maybe are not as interested in science or people who have been pushed away from science of it could be interested in? Like, this is something where, like, I am not a traditional programmer. I do not have a computer science degree. Uh, and I got into programming because I like building things. I like making stuff. And that's something where looking at the creativity aspect of it, looking at, hey, um, you know, I know tons of designers who turned into front-end developers 
because they got tired of, this, of front end developers fucking up their designs. <laughs> and they realized that like, oh my god, when I'm able to actually write this code, I have this incredible power to create. And I think that's the side that, that, that would be really, really helpful to focus on. Um, because I think it's honestly something that drives a lot of really uh, uh, talented men away as well. Where it's something particularly it affects women um, when computer, computer programming is looked at as purely a science um, because of a lot of the sort of long-term cultural stereotypes around women. But I think it's something where uh, that, that is something where anyone who's in those sort of long-term cultural stereotypes, anyone where people are like, oh, you're not supposed to be interested in these things, if you can make, make things more accessible to them, if you can say, hey, we can, we can make this more interesting to people, then they're going to actually be able to see what they can do with some of these powers. And I think the, the talk that you pointed out um, where, where uh, the guy was talking about how we've set the bar so high for becoming uh, a software programmer that it scares people away. I think that, to me, is the significantly larger problem because I think it scares so many people who could really kick at the ass at this away. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I agree. I can, <laughs> I can relate to what Ellen says, and uh, I think you know, one of the biggest things I hear from other women is that they think that it's very complex and very uh, hard to do, whereas everyone can learn it, as you know. <laughs> Everyone. So, uh, yeah. It's I think also, it's like you said, a relatively recent thing that it was such a sausage fest in programming. Like, it's like 30 years ago, it was much more easy. Yeah, we're way more women programmers. In the 70s, it's changed a bit. The theory is that it's changed because of microcomputers. Because that's the voice thing. In the 80s, uh, everyone had a computer at home, and before that, it was basically the job. So you became a programmer or a computer. Uh, so a lot of women just did that. In the 60s, 70s, uh, pro computer programmers were 80%, 90% women. And only in the 70s, 80s, it changed to 90% men. And that's the whole research about that. It's very interesting to read. Yeah, it is, this topic is so broad and so deep. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.